we now come to a plenary session entitled No Innovation and Growth Without Risk-Taking. And what we're going to do is, uh, I'm just going to speak for two minutes at the beginning, then we're going to have five minutes each from uh, the panelists, a discussion then among ourselves for roughly 20 minutes, and then open it up to Q&A uh, for the next 20 minutes, so the session as a whole will last roughly uh, an hour. Uh, the, the idea of this session is that if we want to have innovation and growth, and we know there are many reasons why we should, then there has to be risk taking. And what we have is three uh, panelists with enormous experience uh, of risk taking in very different sectors and uh, I'd like to briefly introduce them. On my immediate left is Dr. Niklaus von uh, Bomhardt, who uh, studied in the University of Munich, he's German, and did a doctorate in law at the uh, University of Regensburg, uh, is at present the chairman of the board of management uh, of Munich Re, where he has spent uh, the bulk of his career uh, building up the business in Brazil uh, and now uh, being chairman of the Board of Management, so uh, running the group. Then next to him is Sanjeev Goenka, who's from India, and has the distinction of running a company uh, with a few billion dollar turnover, which was founded 182 years ago by his uh, great, great, great grandfather. Um, and that company is in uh, power generation, coal mining, distribution, uh, and so on. He's, in recognition of what he's achieved as a businessman, he's been president of the All India Management Association and Confederation of Indian Businesses, and so on. And then thirdly, there's an ex-colleague of mine uh, uh, who I'm delighted to introduce, Martin Taylor. Uh, Martin read uh, Chinese at Oxford or Cambridge? At Oxford. Uh, and then he became a journalist on the Financial Times working on the Lex column. He then went into very, he's been involved in various companies and so on. Um, but he's been the chief executive officer of Barclays. He was the chairman of WH uh, Smith. He's at present the chairman of the board of directors of the board of directors of Syngenta. And um, in addition, he, he was a member of the Independent Banking Commission in the UK, which really has redrawn the whole landscape of banking. So he's had uh, a great influence in the UK. The, the idea is that uh, Dr. von Bomhardt is clearly from the reinsurance business, the financial sector, and then we have utilities, power generation, with Goenka, and then with Martin, with Syngenta, we have the agribusiness, etc. And I, I'd like to start, gentlemen, by asking you, um, what do you see as uh, the risks in your business and how you manage them and how you see them expanding in the future? And then I thought after that, we should probably move on to say, uh, do we have enough risk taking in Western countries today uh, compared to, for example, India or China. Uh, and if we feel we don't, what incentives should we have? Uh, and in a way, almost coming back to the end of that last session, which is the issue of rules versus discretion. As a society, as economy, we need rules. On the other hand, uh, specific um, problems lead us to say we should have a lot of discretion. So I, I'm going to ask you if you'll start with your own sort of backyards and tell us about risk. So first of all, uh, Dr. Niklaus von Bomhard. Thank you, Lord Griffith. I would like to start uh, connecting risk to innovation because this was also the title and making a few remarks to warm us up for our panel discussion as regards the connection of the two. And I think what is important to always see that innovation as such is a long process and you have input and output factors. And on this sort of timeline of innovation, 
you can place yourself, be it as a society, as a company, or as an individual, in very different spots and still make a lot out of innovation. So, for example, being a German, we tend to be rather at the beginning part of it, basic research and so forth. And if you were an American, for example, you as an American, you would be probably more at the end, at least renowned for the end work of really developing something that sales well. So this, I think, is the first comment that I would like to make. So if we talk innovation and risk, we should really see what phase exactly of the innovation process we're talking about. Second basic remark is about the, the relevance of innovation, and that, of course, might be a no-brainer for most of you, that, of course, there will be no growth, no sustainable growth without innovation. I think this is a given. And that maybe is also why the relevance that is being perceived in different parts of the world of innovation may be different at certain times. Whether you are in the growth mode or not so much in the growth mode, then innovation may play a different role. But you cannot just increase the, the relative share of the population at work to the overall population, which would increase, of course, growth and wealth over time, nor can you work with the real assets alone only because there, there's an end to the real assets. So it has to be something that connects the two ingredients of, of what comes out of it, wealth, and that means efficiency, innovation, how do I use the workforce and how do I use the real assets that are at work. The third basic remark is about, of course, risk in connection with innovation. And as I said, there are certain times where you are more ready to take a risk that goes for societies, companies and individuals alike. And one should, to the extent possible, I think, make oneself aware why am I rather open to innovation or not. And for someone who runs a company, I can tell you there is times where you really have to kick and push people to live the innovative ideas, and there's times where you keep the lid nicely on, on the pot and say, well, this is not, and not the time now to, to innovate too much. However, you will always have to innovate. It's a permanent process. This is not like a, uh, like a switch that you turn it on and off, because if you turn it off completely, it will be very difficult to turn it on again. So the spirit must be there, but there are times where you are more ready to take risk that comes necessarily with innovation. The fourth remark goes for the financial industry and innovation, and here I start with a quote from Paul Volcker, who said once, and many of you will know the quote, I think, and the only useful banking innovation of the last decades was the invention of the ATM. That, of course, is some sort of a cynical statement to make, but I know why he made it, and you probably do as well. I think the financial industry is a little different when it comes to innovation, because a lot of the innovation takes place in processes, much more sometimes than in products, but also in products there are and have been very relevant innovations, take derivatives as a whole, interest rate swaps and the like, then we have ETFs that have been built, Important, however, is that we in the financial industry never forget that we also work, and that may be coming up later when it comes to discretion, rules, regulation, within a certain value set. So whatever we do as an innovation, it should be transparent, and we should ask ourselves deeply whether and where do we in fact create value. Is it maybe, in the worst case, only for our own wallets? The fifth remark is about insurance in the context of innovation. That is a topic that is close to my heart because insurance or reinsurance is normally mentioned only in the context of stabilizing economies or companies by taking away from them risks that are not at the heart of their very business and making sure that they get hit, they can reassume the very business they're in as quickly as possible. That's the stabilizing part of insurance. But there is another one that I would call pace-making part of it. And that is whenever you have new things, innovative uh, things in the world, that insurance can appear on, on two ends. One is taking part of that pilot risk involved with innovation and insure it and take that risk away from whoever is the inventing force or even the investor by the end of the day. And the other one is being ourselves investors. So saying, well, we are ready to invest in certain innovations and supporting them by our very investment. So there's a role for us to play too. And now 
a short word only on the risk. The risk landscape for us is, of course, moving all the time. But I would not say that the recent developments should take us or surprise us or should have surprised us entirely because there's nothing that we have seen in the, in the, over the last years that was entirely unthinkable. There are bits and pieces that I think were rather at the fatter tail of our distribution, but nothing was unthinkable, so we should not act at least as insurers as if we were taken by surprise completely by what has happened both on the financial crisis side or on the natural catastrophe side, which was heavy last year, by the way, over the last five years. With that, I would turn no, it over. Can, can yeah. I just ask you one question, because it, it was a fascinating question following Paul Volcker. Do you think in the financial sector that with innovation that we've seen in, say, the last decade, we have created socially useless products? The answer is yes. <laughs> I'm sure. Can I say I would have predicted that would have got a big applause from a Swiss audience. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to clear that up, that's yeah. all. Sanjeev. Good morning and... Uh, Thank you very much for having me here. It's a real privilege. I'd like to uh, start by saying that we are all aware that we live in an era of uncertainties. Uncertainties caused by political upheavals, uncertainties caused by economics, and indeed, uncertainties caused by technology. I'm going to confine my first few comments on a risk that we took as a company and how it paid off, and how a risk, an opportunity that was presented to us, we did not take because we thought it was a risk, and we were worse off. The first was our foray into the energy sector, a power distribution company in Calcutta, which is the capital of Bengal in eastern India. And this was 20 years ago. Power in India was not privatized. And it was an opportunity which came up. Calcutta suffered from 12 hours of power cuts every day. The plant load factors, which means the efficiency of the uh, equipments, was at less than 50%. The debt equity ratio of the company was at 5.4 is to 1. And when uh, a set of merchant bankers came to us with this proposal, Almost everyone in the room said, oh, that's crazy, we shouldn't be looking at it. And something, something told me that it's doable, and we studied it, we looked at it, and we went ahead with the decision to invest in that company. It came at a price of $2.5 million, that's it. Uh, it was a challenge. It was a challenge in terms of getting the large workforce re declared redundant. It was a challenge in terms of motivating the workforce to perform better. It was a challenge in terms of actually providing power to the city of Calcutta and not having power cuts. It took eight years. At the end of eight years, we stand now as the most efficient power utility in India across every operating parameter. We are the first thermal power company in Asia to have registered with UNFCC for carbon credits. It was a risk. It appeared like, almost like a foolish decision. It was a decision that paid off. And this company today is capitalized at $2.6 billion, two and a half million going to 2.6 billion. I will talk about one risk that recently, one opportunity that we let go, and I haven't regretted anything more than this. There was a German company called Evonik, which is the third largest carbon black uh, producer in the world, and we are the eighth largest producers of carbon black, and this was an opportunity that came our way for acquisition. And we engaged in a due diligence, we engaged in studying the company, and uh, 
We felt they were in three geographies which were not conducive to retrenchment, and we opted to play safe, and we did not go ahead with that investment. And 16 months down the road, I think it is one of the worst decisions that we have taken. It was a risk that we did not take. The company, which got sold for roughly 1.1 billion euros, would today be worth already over two billion, and I can see it now getting to about three in the next two years. So, suffice it to say, if you don't take risk, you're not going to grow. You're not going to gain. Coming as I do from India, I can't but be reminded of a very ancient Indian philosopher, Gautama, the Buddha. who said in sanskrit and i translate that life is full of creativity life is full of change and those people who don't change who don't take risks will not grow thank you two wonderful examples You can make a. F you're a natural communicator yeah. and filmmaker. You should have been showing a film. I was going um, to ask Sanjeev to let me know next time he has a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Martin, over to you. Well, as as um, Brian has told you, I have the good fortune to chair Syngenta, and in the current financial market ballet of risk on, risk off, risk on, risk off, we are seen as a defensive stock, a relatively low risk exposure. But as a matter of fact, I can tell you within this room. That is a matter of routine. We run the most colossal risks. Um, we are investing on a 20-year horizon in um, uncertain research into new products. Uh, I mean, the the, the time of um, getting a product to market from uh, idea or, or pre-invention is at least 15 years. Um, in financial exposures um, to currency mismatches, like many Swiss companies, we are structurally short the Swiss franc. Which is not a good thing to be, to food and energy prices, which determine to a very large extent the cost and the demand for our products. In manufacturing processes, where we have to control complex environmental exposures and handle hazardous um, raw materials, and in government affairs, where we face a mounting regulatory ratchet, um, which changes or um, um, is augmented with every um, electoral cycle. And of course, if we happen to get any of this wrong, uh, we run reputational risk, uh, especially since some of our product areas, um, are pesticides and uh, GM seeds, to mention but two, don't often win popularity contests. Um, but we do this cheerfully, and we sleep very well, um, because it is simply obvious to anybody um, involved in this kind of business that without the acceptance of these risks, we shouldn't be able. To earn a satisfactory return for our shareholders, um, who themselves, of course, are providing future security to people who um, need money to live on after retirement. Uh, nor should we be able to make the remarkable contribution that Syngenta makes to food security. Um, put quite simply, that's not time this morning. But if we can't get technology, uh, not only to big farmers, but to smallholder farmers in Asia and Africa. Over the next decade or two, there won't be enough to eat in 30 years' time. Um, so we run risks. Um, we believe um, in an excellent cause all round, and yet the country that's our home, um, Switzerland, and its neighbours, particularly its neighbours, show increasing reluctance to take risks, which is what we've heard before. If you'll indulge me, Brian, for a second, I also wanted. Um, I, I'm clearly. Conscious of this in the business environment I work in, you think why this might be, and you look at you look through a, a historian's perspective at the big changes in European society in the last 50 years, and there seem to me to be three um, that really matter. One, we've got a lot richer. Um, we may not be rich forever, um, but we're much richer than our grandparents were, and richer people have more to lose. They become more risk averse. They're more frightened of loss. We're older. We're, we're a society that, along with Japan, is one of the most aged the world has ever seen.、Um, with every year, I become more convinced of the wisdom of age. Um, but, 
the, the old, nevertheless, the old are more fearful than the young. Curious, really, when you think about it. Um, but uh, man is a curious creature. And we live, of course, in an increasingly feminized society. And by that I mean that women, and about time too, um, have much, much more of a say than they had one or two generations ago in the choices that society makes. And on the whole, this has excellent aspects. Um, we go to war slightly less frequently. Um, but we do see dangers. Um, we, it's, it's a society which sees dangers, particularly to the health of our children, whether they're there or not. Um, and we, f we fall for the fallacy of risk elimination. Um, we want to remove risks completely. And of course, as was mentioned by some of the speakers this morning, risk like energy is, is neither created nor destroyed. It's merely passed around. And very frequently, when we think we are getting rid of a risk, um, we're replacing it by an unseen one. I could say a lot more about that, but I'll pause there, Ryan. Sorry, I was taking notes and thought you were just going to carry on. Uh, I'm happy to if you prefer, but I think not. Um, can I just ask one, uh, one question that interests me? Is uh, this whole issue of regulation, to what extent regulation has become and is becoming more of a serious barrier than it ever has been to risk taking? Well, one thing is for sure, the more regulation you have, the less option space you have in your very business. And it will, and for sure, limit risk taking to some extent, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for not so good reasons. But I overall, I think not only for political reasons, after the experiences we have all made, that decent and good regulation is of essence. And there is room for improvement. And like in all those things with bad experiences, the pendulum never stops where you want it to stop. So I think that the discussion on regulation is not at an end yet, and it deserves more time from all of us. But regulation is needed, and I think the society as such, and the politicians representing us, have a duty to set the framework right. And regulation is their tool. So if society doesn't want certain risks to be taken big time, it should be transparent as a decision. That is important to me, that sometimes you feel that it is not, and it was a topic at the earlier panel too, is everybody aware what is going on and what the consequences are? And we as a society must make up our mind how much risk do we want. Risk comes at a price, there is an upside, there is a downside, as Sanjeev quite vividly explained, and we must be sure that we place ourselves where we feel comfortable. That will be different for different societies at certain times. The more global the world, the more we tend to try to set the calibration the same for all, which is very difficult, because what is being perceived as the just perfect regulation in one place is perceived as stifling everything in somewhere, some other place. So that must be at least a transparent process. One thing is for sure, we never get it right for all times. So we must continue to work on it, but we had and still have a lot to do to get the regulation right this time. And as I think, I don't know who said it, and we must make sure that we do not just to try to solve the problem of the last crisis. As the spectrum, what we would like to tackle must be much broader. Sanjeev, you operate around the world. Uh, I just wonder to what extent you feel that in Europe the regulation is getting greater in the areas you're in, as opposed to what we uh, somewhat patronizingly call emerging markets. You know, I think sometimes regulation is being used as a tool for protectionism, and not necessarily in Europe, but for example, in recent past, you've seen in Indonesia, in Australia, taxes being imposed on natural mineral resources being exported out of the country. And they give it the garb of regulation, uh, but it is actually protectionism. And to my mind, any regulation that borders on protectionism is not true regulation. Uh, so that's the point I'd like to make, that uh, Regulation, which is transparently done, which is objectively done, is great. Mm. But regulation 
which is used as a tool is not great. Right. Yeah. Should we clap? <laughs> oh, welcome. Yeah. Martin, you, you mentioned uh, the fascinating idea of increasing wealth, getting older, more feminine society, leading in Europe to a more risk-averse society. Do you think in that case that governments in European countries, maybe in all countries, but specifically in Europe, should be uh, offering incentives for risk-taking which are not at present. For example, in the UK, there's a big debate. Uh, lots of small businesses say uh, the regulations of the European Union are hampering us from growing. We know that jobs come primarily from small and medium-sized industries. Can't we have a change and can't we have, you know, I mean, how would you respond to that sort of, I mean, a response to what you raised in terms of these trends, which were fascinating? Well, I, I was simply trying to, to say that here are three mega trends which all, all move slightly in the direction of, of risk aversion. So it's not really surprising when they're all playing out that we go that way. Um, regulation, good regulation is a public good. I, I, there's, a, there's absolutely no question. Um, we can also agree that over regulation is excessive. Um, we can't always agree on where the boundary between the two is. Um, I, I'm, I was coming at it rather more from the um, consumer end. I mean, we're in a highly regulated industry, uh, and quite right too, our products are, are regulated to pieces um, before farmers are allowed to plant them. They're more highly regulated than pharmaceuticals, actually, um, because, the, because not only their effects on humans have to be taken into account, but their effects on the environment as well. Um, but you do get... Um, I think it's very difficult for consumers to judge, to judge risk intelligently. Um, if I can just throw out on two or three examples. Um, I was thinking about this uh, the other day when I was, in a, I was almost in a fatal car crash in Germany, um, being driven at 200 kilometers an hour on the motorway when a car across the road blew up. Um, this is a, an objectively insane thing to be able to do. Um, and yet you go into a German underground car park and there are big signs up saying, Vergiftungsgefahr, um, danger of poisoning, which do nothing but increase the public's fear that out there there are little tiny things that are going to give them cancer. Um, we know that the, the, um, in France, um, if I talk about pesticides for a moment, uh, there is an obsession uh, in France with um, pesticides. They rank with globalization as one of the two ills that are um, <laughs> undermining, <laughs> undermining the French Republic. And uh, <laughs> they seem to... All ills. The, the, and people worry desperately about um, the, um, the supposedly carcinogenic um, effects of these things. Um, I have to tell you that anybody who consumes alcohol uh, as I do enthusiastically, um, <laughs> and worries about carcinogenic reasons from uh, pesticide residues is, is just not thinking straight. You know, uh, I mean, if we, tried, if we tried to register alcohol as a pesticide to, to spray on fields in dilute quantities, it would not pass the first hurdle. <laughs> and, and yet we, we put it in glasses and drink it. Um, when the nuclear part... When, the disaster of Fukushima occurs. Rather than thinking, maybe it's a bad idea to build power stations on earthquake faults, we just turn against the, um, the industry altogether. And, you know, in Germany and Switzerland, two of the only countries where I feel they would really know how to do it safely, <laughs> which is a bit of a shame. And I, I could repeat these examples, many. We, we don't think straight because we... I don't know if any of you have read, and I'm sure many of you have, the wonderful book by Daniel Kahneman, um, I'm Thinking Fast and Slow, where he says that human beings think in two ways. They think in the instinctive way, which we learnt on the African savannah all those years ago, uh, where we recognize danger. Um, can I get across this stream or not? And then we think in the laborious way that you are taught to think in the University of St. Gallen. And, <laughs> and the, the second way is really hard work. But it's the second way that distinguishes us from the apes. And very often, when we perceive dangers, we're doing it in this instinctive first way. 
And we need to improve our risk management techniques, really, as a society. Um, we are in a highly educated society. We need to explain things better. And we need more Bengal tigers. We need more Bengal tigers, we do. <laughs> I'm now going to open it up to discussion. Uh, if we could just have the lights to come up. I always have this problem of seeing people. In it. There's a hand here. Please do get up, say who you are, and ask the question. With high marks are given for brevity. I'll try not to disappoint. My name is Rob Tel Paley. I'm from Liberia. I'm a leader of tomorrow, um, and I'm a PhD student at the University of London. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I have to respectfully disagree with you about the overfeminization because I think the over. <laughs> The overlying assumption, um, and even using empirical evidence, I had a chance to look through the booklet and I realized that I could count the amount of women on my one hand um, who are leading workshop discussions and are, are even on panelists. So the assumption that there are more women inhabiting positions of power or leadership will trickle down and eradicate patriarchy, I think is um, a dangerous assumption. I come from a country in which uh, we elected the first female president of an entire continent. And you'll find that gender disparities still exist. Uh, women's economic empowerment is still a challenge. Uh, violence against women is still a challenge. So I think we have to really th rethink um, when we talk about the overfeminization of, of leadership, because I think that's um, a dangerous assumption that we're making. May I, I think. May I respectfully, may, may, I, may I respectfully ask you to listen to what I said? <laughs> rather than what you were afraid I was saying. <laughs> I did not use the word over-feminization. I said society was much more feminized than in the past, and I regard it as an entirely good thing. And I don't measure feminization by, um, purely by the number of people, the number of um, women leading panel sessions. I entirely agree with you that it is desirable that there should be more. But to pretend that the women of today do not influence opinion much more than their mothers and grandmothers did, is simply being blind to what is happening in our society. And because we have not arrived at the place that you believe and many believe that we should be, does not, believe that, and does not mean that the journey has not, has not started. And to close our eyes to something that is happening because it is taboo to talk about it is not worthy of a university, I would say. Gentleman, I think a gentleman. Yes, a gentleman here. <laughs> and there are two hands up there towards the back. The one on, on my right, at least, first, and then, so there are three people. Firstly, gentleman here. Uh, hello, my name's Alwyn. I live in Oxford. Um, and I just wanted to ask, in a society which, particularly economically, has become more integrated, and now that so many of us depend for our livelihoods and for our futures on businesses which, you know, which we have money invested in or you know, our pensions are invested in. Do you think it's businesses have a requirement to f uh, take on less risk because if they collapse, they in jeopardy not only their shareholders and their employees, but also the entire system in which they operate? Question. Dr. Nicholas. Well, yeah, absolutely. I think running a company that is publicly owned, of course, we have to stay close to our investors to find out what their risk appetite is. And Walter Kilots early on then started with the chain of, of action in the company. Once you have found out that risk appetite, then you work with that within the company. And one thing is for sure, you more, the more you have, the more you hate to lose it. And that is why with a more mature society, you have an inbuilt bigger risk aversion in the first place. We as insurance industry know where the middle class is building, this is good clients for us soon, because they will protect the property, they will try to protect themselves against third-party claims. So yes, assuming that risk and chances are symmetric, which they hardly ever are, but let's assume they are, someone who has not much to lose is ready by, I would say by its very nature probably, to take on more risk. Therefore, the more mature industries, countries and the like, will tend to take less. And it is a matter of the very investor base. If you run a company privately, of course, 
This is the discussion among family members, most likely, or with your wife then. Let's assume you're an investor yourself, then you will discuss it, hopefully, with your wife, what and how much risk you should take. But I would not go so far as to say, and that sometimes was in between the lines here, that Western societies, taking them as the more mature, industrialized <laughs> societies, are always taking less risk. I would say you should ask yourselves, what for, why, make it transparent to yourself and your people, but we as an insurance agency, we live on risk. So if we were extremely risk averse, we would be out of business the next day. So yes, we take risk, and if you take natural catastrophes as a very tangible example, we are taking event risk for six, seven billion euros in one very event. So that is a lot of risk, but our investors know that. It's what they go for. If we take the same amount of risk on the asset side of the balance sheet, my investor base would say, no, let someone else do it, but this is not your job. So it's a matter of discussion, transparency, calibration, and there's not one answer for everyone. For everyone. Sanjeev. Quite honestly, I think uh, risk, if it's taken by one individual or a small group of individuals, is much better taken than if it's with a larger base. The moment you have uh, public investors, you have financial institution investors, then you're bound by what you've committed to them and you're scared not to be able to deliver. And therefore, your risk-taking ability definitely goes down. And sometimes, a larger mass of people cannot actually see the same gain in the risk as, say, just a company board can. I think a company board has to be aware of how risky its underlying activities are. And, I mean, the question of how much financial risk the company takes on top of that, how much leverage you put on a balance sheet, um, is, is, is clearly a function of how risky you think your underlying business is. Um, and it's generally not sensible to pile financial risk on top of uh, a fundamentally risky activity. Looked at from the point of view of shareholders, so therefore of society, you might say, because the shareholders stand in as, um, um, through insurance companies and pension funds, they don't mind about individual companies taking risks because they can diversify their risks across a large portfolio. Um, the trouble comes when too many companies are taking too much risk simultaneously, as we saw in the banking crisis. Um, I remember th in 06 and 07, um, it was quite common to have shareholders come to Syngenta, for example, and say, you should have more debt on your balance sheet. You're not taking enough financial risk. Um, we listened to them politely and ignored them. Um, but uh, there was certainly pressure to gear up returns. We haven't heard that for a while. Um, <laughs> ne next time I hear it, I'll know that the next crisis is two or three years away. Did you have the same pressure when you ran Barclays Bank? Um, oh, well, the risk management industry <laughs> was, was less... If it's, if it's it was an embarrassing more primitive, question, more primitive so. stage in those days. No, 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 it's not. Um, the, the, the problem at Barclays in the 90s, really, was simply to measure the risk that was being run. And one of the dangers with the banking system, as we saw in the crisis, was that the regulatory rules from Basel. Um, I'm very loyal to Basel, I live there now. Um, the regulatory rules from Basel were seen as, as um, a replacement for thinking. Uh, I mean, the banks could say, as long as, I'm, uh, as long as I'm fitting in with the Basel rules, I must be okay. Uh, the intelligent banks did not do that. And I think one thing we saw in the financial crisis was which banks had their risk management in reasonable shape. The whole industry was over-leveraged. But you, you could see who, who was doing a good job and who was not. Gentlemen, uh, that's right, the one, five fingers <laughs> in the air. Get a microphone to, if not, why don't you shout? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Peter Schoen. I'm a political scientist from Germany and a leader of tomorrow. I would like to know, individual risk-taking behavior constitutes a fundamental resource for the insurance companies or the insurance sector. Given that, the question is, to which extent are insurance companies capable of promoting a risk-taking mentality? Thank you. Ah. 
Well, it's, it's, there's one truth in that, and that is if you make the car safer for four-wheel drive, whatever you have, people will go faster, and part of the margin of safety that you build by making a car, in fact, safer, you lose immediately by people reacting to the fact that they know the car is safer. And the same holds true to some extent for insurance. So we have to make sure as managers that the loss prevention is not suffering for the mere fact that you can offload the risk. So normally, if you insure, you do both, hopefully. You make sure that the insured, let's take an industrial group, which is a more tangible example here. If you insure a huge industrial group, the good insurer will spend a lot of time talking to the risk managers of the company, checking on risk management quality, then insure to avoid the trap that you, I think, circumphrased, that for feeling so safe, we can get a little easy and light on preventive measures. And that is why I think also insurance has a role to play in take the Deepwater Horizon event, which is, I think, still up on everybody's mind. It was hardly insured. We think, and we in fact built even a policy for that, if you get insurers in, you put two things at work. One, you put a price tag to the risk, which makes it a lot easier for those who decide on what to do or not to do, yeah. who run the rig, for example, shall I do more on the preventive side, should I better check my subcontractors or not? Two, the insurers, hopefully, will ask many, many, many questions. So even governments have an interest sometimes to get insurers in for these two basic reasons. So I would say, yes, there is a risk of relaxation, and it works, I guess, more with individual insurers than with companies who are insured. But we should, as an industry, do everything to do both, making them aware of the risk, so that they buy insurance, but at the same time, then not get them, them leaning back and rather keep the risk as small as possible. Before the society as a whole, I think we should manage risk down, diversify, that's what we do, so that we can take on more to develop better, faster, I'm a little cautious with that word, but get the, the global economy marching. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, that's right. So if you. Stand up. Yep. Thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, thank you very much for the panel discussion today. I'm uh, Nihal Chahan from India, and I'm a leader of tomorrow. Uh, my question basically goes to all, all, all four panelists, basically, and it's more with the idea of to do with the ethics of risk, or maybe the fairness that risk has. I'll give a small example. Uh, I come from India, and in India, in, 80, you know, in the late 80s and 90s, we, were still, uh, we had still not opened up the economy. Now the idea was a lot of the American and you know American government and American firms, the European firms, the Western government said that you know you need to open up the economy, you need to globalize more, you need to be able to you know open it up, stop your subsidies, and that way maybe you'll get more competitive and things will be better for both you and us. You know the whole idea of free trade was a huge argument at that time. Now let's go 20 years hence. All right, Indian econ Indian industries did become competitive. To give an example. We talk about our pharmaceuticals are far more cheaper, probably even more effective. We talk about our services, our IT industry, also quite comparative, and the whole idea of outsourcing came from there. But suddenly the, the talk of free trade, outsourcing, has suddenly become a dirty word. You have American presidential politics being played on that. So what I want to ask is, when risk is played at that time, 20 years before, as one sort of argument, 20 years hence, you can't change the idea of that. So I want to ask your opinion on uh, what are these ideas of protectionism and regulation? Shouldn't they be better analyzed or a little more fair in general for the emerging markets? Thank you. I think, this is, I think you open up there, to me, a fundamental issue, yeah. which is that if we are going to have greater global prosperity and reduce global poverty, we have to have more risk taking we have to have more market economies. And typically what happens is you have growing inequality within these countries in the distribution of income and the kind of things which you were mentioning. Uh, and I'd just like to ask the panel how they respond, because I've got my own question in with his, to his and my question. Let's start with Martin. I mean, the example you give seems to me to be more about hypocrisy than about risk. 
and there's plenty of that about, that's for sure. Um, I, I'm, very, I, I'm just struck by your phrase, the ethics of risk, because it's not one um, that I'd considered, um, because largely I considered risk as a sort of force of nature, like the weather, um, where one doesn't think in ethical terms. But I can certainly imagine that as a, a leader or a person in a position of power, if you inflict risk on other people, you've absolutely got to be able to make sure that they get the, the benefit that goes with the risk, I would say, um, as, a, as a first ethical stab. Um, let me think while the others speak. <laughs> Sanjeev. You know, quite honestly, if uh, you start using your clout or your position or your strength to dilute the transparency or to dilute the openness of any transaction or any economy, it's not fair. And uh, I think it doesn't have as much to do with risk as it has to do with the fair. ethics of governance. Well, First of all, I think it's a very delicate process for a politician to manage all that comes with the WTO in general. In a crisis, of course, it's too inviting for a politician to turn protectionistic, of course, claim something else is responsible, and closing the market down. On the other hand, I admit that alone the fact that the economy or the global economy even can grow faster seems a good argument in the first place, but it should not be the only argument, nor is growth always the, the solution to every problem we have. And it can create problem by itself, for example, if we grow too fast, boom and bust. So if you, we say financial industry to some extent said, well, by did, doing what we did, we propelled global growth. Yes, true, but at what cost? Boom and bust. So growth is needed. So I think if we stick to the paradigm of thinking, which I think is still conventional, but I think this is right too, that open markets perform better than closed markets and that we should divide the work among people, nations, companies and the like. There's many good arguments not to be productionistic, but it must be fair and not hypocritical in the sense that we use the argument to our own ends when needed. And that's why it's so delicate and it's never fair by its very nature. It's never fair. So there's always someone who feels like I'm the winner, I'm the loser at certain points in time. To strike the balance that everybody feels good and bad at the same time is the art of politician. Of a politician, Pascal Lamy, who was mentioned once as the last optimist in our world today, he really tries almost a lifelong now to get that balance right. But it's an uphill struggle in the midst. I think we are still quite in a crisis. It's it's almost impossible to, to move ahead. But we think we should not give up and make sure that these feelings do not, uh, are not being created, but it's difficult. And I, I know if we take India as an example, we are an insurer in India. The market to us is in fact closed for our direct investment still. It's one of the few industries left that never really opened. There's many good and bad reasons for that. So if you go to Germany, I can tell you a number of industries who in fact have trade barriers. You mentioned some other examples. So the world isn't fair here, but I think we should not give up fighting for that. It's worth it, as long as it is rightly calibrated. I think we have time for two more short questions. This time from over here, a lady there, and one more. Another lady here, that's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I think all the people in here are quite convinced that uh, there uh, can is no... I, wh what is your name? My name is Francoise Thomas. I'm from Luxembourg. Um, so I think all the people in here are pretty convinced that there is no innovation and no growth uh, without taking risk. Now, just tell us, when we get back to our offices and institutions uh, next Monday morning, how do we manage to convince enough colleagues that they think the same so how can we create the critical mass to follow along with us? And also, how do we deal with the problem of dilution of responsibility? Because uh, so far I missed the word responsibility in the very interesting discussions. But if we take risk without assuming responsibility, that's very, very dangerous. And unfortunately, in today's society, there is an overall 
evolution towards the illusion of responsibility, and I think that's very, very dangerous. Thank you. I think I'm going to ask the lady here to ask the second question, if we can get a microphone, and then I'm going to ask the panel to uh, ask, uh, deal with both of them together. Could we have a microphone for Melanie, great admirer of St. Gall, the Irishman, Thank you. who came here to fight the bear. My and beloved tame, Lord tame the yes. barbarians and I, who lived I, here. Since we talk about risk, I want to, uh, to respond to the lady who spoke at the beginning. Um, when I was five, I decided to become an uh, editor. And now I'm a redactor, editor, and it's up to the women to follow their, to take risks <laughs> and to follow their aim. It's up to them instead of um, blaming the man who doesn't let them go. It's up to the ladies who follow their aim. Was that a question or a statement? <laughs> <laughs> it's my conviction. It's my firm conviction. Oh, I can believe that. <laughs> it's my conviction too. I think all of the panel are united in supporting you. Uh, Sanjeev. You know, I think... Uh, you talked about how to motivate or how to convince the team that uh, the idea is good or the risk is worth taking. I think there is a difference between a risk and a gamble. A risk is a well thought out plan. It's, it's uncertain in as much as it's not completely certain, but it's not a gamble. Uh, and I think it must be logically driven. It must be technologically driven. And uh, if you've, uh, over a period of time, had the track record of being successful or right more often than not, team will automatically rally around behind you. Thank you. Uh, the, Martin. The question of how you convince your colleagues um, is a very good one because it, it, it brings up an aspect that we haven't mentioned today, um, I mean, clearly we're talking at a very high level and superficial sense, but and uh, there's almost a feeling that, you know, businesses understand that risk is necessary and know how to take it. Um, unfortunately, the general public is frightened of it. Um, in a business, and businesses are, of course, social organisms, they're collections of people um, at any level, uh, there are great differences, I think, between individuals' risk appetite. And one of the things that businesses get wrong is having a group of people at the top who are either on some spectrum, I don't know how you measure it, too reckless or too timid. Um, I have worked with, um, I mean, one of the most impressive executives I worked with um, when I was a young man um, would have gone a lot further and been a, a, an even better executive than he was if he had been able to cross the stream. And he could always think of reasons for not doing the necessary but slightly risky thing. I think we've all known people like that. Um, in a healthy business, there is a, a spectrum of, I mean, there's a group of people with different um, attitudes to risk, and I think it can be um, enormously um, productive if that is the case, and to other things too. I mean, you want diversity in all ways. Um, as far as diluting responsibility goes, I've heard of this, but I've never managed to work out how to do it. And um, I'd be very interested if you could tell me afterwards how one, how one fails to take responsibility for things. Can I say, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've had a fascinating session with three people with an enormous amount of experience, very different sectors. What's come across to me is the complexity of the subject we're talking about. It's, we've only, in a way, uh, put our toe in the water. I mean, there is so much to discuss in this area. But I'd like you very much to give them a great hand for their presentation. Thank you.